right, Silvana, let's start off by talking about whether you work or whether you study. So do you work or study? At the moment, I work. Mm -hmm. I work in the hospital, which mm -hmm. is called L&D Hospital, which is based in the town where I live mm -hmm. at the moment in Luton. Mm -hmm. And what is your job? Uh, at the moment, I do nursing associate practitioner, which is um, a kind of assistant nurse. But my dream job is to be a fully qualified staff nurse, hopefully in the future. And do you enjoy your job? I do enjoy my job. I do enjoy my job quite a lot. That's the reason why I choose to be a nurse, although at the moment I don't fully practice it as a nurse. But the main reason why I choose it is because of I like to have contact with people and this job gives me that opportunity and it's quite challenging job. It can be quite challenging sometimes, but it's a lot rewarding at the same time as well. That's why I like it. And have you always wanted to do this job? Um, I remember since I was a little child that always been my dream job. So I always used to play with my friends like I was the nurse looking after them when they get hurt. So I don't remember myself seeing myself in other in other profession. So this was my always been my my dream job. Okay, now let's talk about your hometown. Where are you from? I'm from Albania, which is a small country uh, in the southeastern part of Europe. That's where I come from. And can you describe your hometown to me? Uh, I was born in a little village in Albania. It's very small, like, you know, typical Albanian village. Uh, well, what I remember about my hometown is the scenery because it always was, you know, green, a lot of open spaces, a lot of spaces to play as a child. It was nice, nice place to, you know, to grow up. Is it a good place for tourists to visit? Um, I would say the, the town, which is close by to my village, which is called Korcha, that is a really nice and interesting place to visit. If you want to come as a tourist, there's lots to ex explore. Like if you, uh, if you are, uh, a, I don't know, a nature lover, you can go and, you know, explore lakes. Uh, or you can go up the mountains and, you know, if you are an active person and want to try and explore different type of sports, that's, there's another good option there. Or if you love museums, that's, you know, that's lots to see and a lot to do in this. Although it's a small uh, city, it still lots, has lots to offer for the tourist. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And now let's talk about social media. Um, which social media apps do you have on your phone? Uh, at the moment, I have Facebook and Instagram. This is my two social apps, which I use like in day to day basic. Mm -hmm. And how often do you check your social media? Um, before I used to check it like every day, but now because I'm, I think because I'm you know, busy with other, other stuff, maybe in two, three days a week, I would just open it and just go through through it and just check it. But um, I won't say I'm addicted to it or we check it every single day. Do you ever post things on social media? Uh, I do post um, mainly like pictures of uh, um, me and my children because um, my family, she, uh, my family is not based in the UK. So that's the only connection that I have with my family or that's an, I would say as an opportunity for my family to to see my children and that's that's the way you know of keeping in touch even with my um, my friends who don't live in the UK but they're still based in Albania so there's a way of, of still connecting with them and keeping in touch with each other. And do you think you will use social media more or less in the future? Uh, if I go by my experience, I see that I'm using less and less. Maybe because at the moment I focus on other things, you know, do more studying and maybe because my job and my children keeps me busy and I've got less time to dedicate to social media. Good. So that's the end of part one, Silvana. Now we're going to move on to part two. 
I'm going to show you a cue card with the topic on it. And you should look at that cue card and you'll have one minute to look at the cue card and you can think about the answer and prepare an answer for one minute. After the one minute, I will ask you to talk for up to two minutes about that topic on the cue card. Any questions about that? That's no? Okay. You've done this before? <laughs> okay. So here you are. And I'll start the timer now. So you have one minute. Okay, so Lana, please speak for up to two minutes. Yep. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, a traditional thing, which um, I bought it for my house. But this is kind of a traditional handmade picture. Uh, back home is um, it's very, very traditional to have this in your own home because when I went last year, when I went back home, I bought this handmade picture. It doesn't have an, a specific name, uh, so I don't know how to, to call it in English. It doesn't have a specific name in English, but is um, it has to do with our tradition, with Albanian tradition. and. The reason why I bought it is because it doesn't have any um, financial benefits or doesn't have any economic benefits to my home. The only reason why I bought it is because it's a sentimental thing. Because uh, sometimes I've been living in the UK for 10 years, but I still miss my my hometown a lot. So by it's like when I bought this picture, it's like I bought a piece of my hometown and I I have it with me in my new home, which I created here in the UK. And every time I see it, it will bring a lot of memory to me. And he, it will make me f feel happier. And it makes still me, makes me feel like related with my hometown. Uh, although I've lived in here for 10 years and probably England is going to be my hometown for a long, long time now. I still want to keep that connection, that, that strong connection that I still have with my hometown. And another reason why I bought it is because I want to, I want my own children to know the part of our history. And I want them to get to know the Albanian culture instead of the English culture as well. Okay, very good, well done. Can I have the cue card back please? Excellent. All right, so we've been talking about something you bought for your home and we're going to continue uh, to talk about how to create a nice home. So why do some people spend a lot of money on creating a nice home? Uh, might be for different people, might be different reason why they choose to spend a lot of money to create a nice environment. Uh, I think when you go back home after a stressful day at work, maybe if you have a nice and comfortable house, it will make you feel relaxed, um, less stressed. Maybe other people might think that, you know, that's the way how they we make them feel happier. And if they can afford to spend a lot of money, why not? And you might bring them more happiness to the environment. And do you have to spend a lot of money to create a nice home? For me personally, I don't think so. It, it depends what makes you feel happier because some people they, they might be made very materialist. That's, you know, they spend a lot of money, it makes them feel happy. But for me personally, um, I, I don't like to spend a lot of money to create uh, a happier home, just, you know, by, by having the, the basic things for me is enough as far as I have the, the other things, the, the happiness that my children being in the home or creating a nice environment for them. That's, that's my main reason. I don't want to spend a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And why do some people not care at all about creating a nice home? Mm, this is... Um, difficult question but, I don't know you will it depends 
maybe maybe they spend a lot of their time outside the house maybe they're more interested in the work lifestyle than they're interested in in their own house or some of them maybe they just don't care that's that's the way they choose them to live their life now let's talk about different types of home um how is living in an apartment better than living in a house i think it's got some advantages if you live in apartment compared with if you live in your in the house you don't have to do a lot of gardening for example that's a that's a main thing the people that don't like gardening or they don't know how to look after the plants and stuff that like they they think that choosing to live in an apartment is quite convenient as well you then uh, you don't have to worry for maintenance of your like you have to worry if it's your own house you just have to maybe pay some extra money for maintenance and somebody else will deal with the problems but if you have your own house then you have to be more hands to it while apartment is more convenient is some people might feel even more secure if they live in an apartment rather than living in in a private house it makes them feel maybe more more secure and in the future do you think more people will live in apartments or more people will live in houses is is hard to tell but if the population i think the population grows in the same numbers is is growing maybe it's going to be more convenient for people to live in apartments because there's not going to be enough land where to build keep building new houses so maybe this is a solution to the overpopulation of our planet and then we can save more land for landscaping you know to have more um, greenery areas okay well done that's the end of the test well done thank so you done. thank you so how did you feel about that i did do very well <laughs> yeah i, I think you did you did very very well i think you did very well uh, was there anything that was different from the the other two times that you did the test for real uh, is is very similar to the atmosphere you get on the real test so i don't mm -hmm. think there's no difference in there the only maybe the difference is because you know yeah. you know i know you and the examiner maybe you don't know the person that's sitting next to you but I've, because i've been on the real test and usually they're very they're very welcoming yeah. they never make you feel like you know, in pressure or stressed or... Yeah, normally they're, they're yeah. like that. Not all of them, but no, norm no, normally yeah. they're, they're like that. If you do get someone in your, nice. ne in your next yeah. test um, who's not very friendly, don't, don't, don't bother. Um, you know, they, they might just be having a bad day, you know, so don't worry about it and um, just to give the same performance. So you need a, a 6.5. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the test and then I'm going to talk about the four marking criteria. I don't think there's any chance that you will get below a 6.5, but what I would like to do is to give you the confidence so that you feel confident on test day mm -hmm. and you're not worrying too much about speaking because your main worry is writing. Mm -hmm. So I would, you know, if somebody is really worried about speaking and then they're also worried about writing, it can drain their, their energy a little bit. So we want to give you as much confidence as, as possible. It's a long day. Yeah. And, and speaking in a different language is tiring, you know, mm -hmm. so, so, so let's talk about each part. So part one, the part, uh, the, the thing that I really liked about uh, your performance in part one was it was nearly exactly the same as when we were speaking before the test. So when I was speaking to you and your husband, you were speaking to me like you were a friend or a colleague in the same way that I would speak to, to Justin or to one of my friends, just in a nice relaxed way. And, and, and uh, you had no problem dealing with any of those questions. You gave full answers, you developed them well, your fluency was good, your coherence was good. Um, we'll talk about grammar and vocabulary later, you have no problems with, with pronunciation, but you, you had no issues at all. Um, sometimes when people do part one, 
the first few questions, they're a little bit nervous, but I didn't sense that from you at all. You didn't really seem that, like you were nervous or you were worried about it. Um, so I, I don't think I, have, I would have any um, worries for you. Um, in part one. One of the things that I noticed was, and we'll talk about grammar later in a second, but one of your areas of weakness when it comes to grammar is uh, verb tenses. Um, for example, when I said, will you use social media in the future? You were using the, the progressive tense, the, uh, you're talk using present continuous uh, to describe what you were doing in the future. You're saying, I am using it less. Um, one of the ways, instead of using will or going to, for example, to talk about the future. One of the things that the examiner will do is they will ask you about the past, the present, the future. They'll ask you how often you do something. They'll ask you to compare things. What are your favorite things? So they're trying to get you to use different grammatical structures like compare things, comparatives. What's your favorite things? Superlatives. How often do you do things? Um, uh, the past, the present, the future, different uh, verb tenses. And you can sometimes judge that by the, the type of question that they, they ask you. So if they ask you about the future, you're going to use, uh, you know, will or going to or something like that. Future uh, structures that we would use to describe the future. If they're saying, how has your hometown changed? Uh, if you compare it to 20 years ago, you might be using present perfect or past simple. So that could help you um, with your verb tenses by listening to what they're trying to get you to do in the test. So if they say, what did you do last weekend? Past simple. What do you normally do at the weekend? You're going to use present simple because you're talking about habit and things that you do. So you can you can tell what they're looking for um, and that can help you in, in part one. But I don't think you have a major problem with tenses, but it's one of your, your weak areas. So just I don't think you have a huge problem in part one, but I'd like to help yeah. help you out as much as I can. Um, Part two was very, very good. You had no problem speaking for the two minutes. The thing that the examiner is listening out for is uh, mostly fluency and coherence. So uh, were you able to speak without much effort for the full two minutes? And you had no problem talking for the two minutes. And I think you could, you could have spoken for three or four or five minutes about that topic without much effort. There was some small hesitations and things like that. We'll talk about that later, um, but you no problem with, with part two, um, so that was good. So based on, on that, I don't think you'll have any problems with part two. Part three, uh, the, one of the main things the examiner will be listening out for in part three is development of your ideas. Um, one of the problems that you have that we did, dealt with today when we were working on our writing was answering the question, explaining how that answers the question, using examples. And I, I think this is a good opportunity for you to kind of kill two birds with one stone by, you could maybe practice part three questions and you can use the structure that we were talking about today for task two writing, which is answer the question, explain, example because you were sometimes you were answering questions where you're like i don't know some people would think this and some people would think that and some people would think a third thing and some people would think without really developing it and then sometimes you would answer the question but your explanation might not have been as as cohesive and as coherent as as i would have liked so i think that could be an area where you if you wanted to practice speaking Part, get some part three questions and kind of try and um, answer them in by using that kind of format of like answer the question, explain why you think that or why it answers the question, and then also use examples. Um, so we were talking about, um, do you have to spend a lot of money to create a nice home? Well, why not talk about some of the things that you do in your home that don't maybe don't cost that much money? Um, we were talking about how is an apartment better than living in a house? I don't know if you live in an apartment or a house, but that you know, if you if you live in a house, what, what what do you like about living in a house? You know, talk about well, at my house we have a garden and it's really nice to play with the kids in the garden, and you know, because those things are very easy to talk about, and often people get to part three and they're like, oh, I just want this to be over. I've been talking for fifteen minutes, so those little examples from your real life 
or you know my husband works in construction and he builds houses and I've noticed that he's building a lot more apartments these days so that that's probably an indication that in the future but well you know what I'm you know what I'm saying um I don't think you had a huge problem with part three um but I think those are just some ways that make it easier for yourself make your job easier and then you'll have more energy and more focus and when we're doing doing the writing so um the last two times you did the speaking test you got about seven I can see why you got you got such a high score pronunciation I can understand everything that you say to get a seven or above the examiner will have to understand a hundred percent of what you're saying you've no problems with with pronunciation we could talk about higher level pronunciation features but for someone like you that needs a 6.5 it's overdoing it we don't need to talk about intonation and sentence stress and connected speech and things like that because you don't really need to waste your time on that because there are other things i.e the writing test that we need to spend more time and, and in order to get a, a high score overall we should spend most of our energy on things that need spend our energy on fixing our weaknesses and, and pronunciation is not a weakness for you um, your your coherence is good. You answer the question that has been asked. You develop your answers. Some of them in part three could have been a bit of, a bit more developed, but overall your coherence is good. Your fluency is also very very good. You do hesitate at times, but those hesitations are when you're trying to think of the next thing to talk about. You're trying to think of content. You're trying to think of ideas. You're not pausing and hesitating because you can't think of the correct word or the correct grammar. So I don't think you have any problems with um, fluency. You have a nice range of vocabulary as well. Your vocabulary is very strong. One area that you could maybe work on a little bit is collocations. Um, but again, someone who needs a 6.5, I wouldn't say to them, okay, you need to spend six months improving your vocabulary or improving your, your collocations because we don't need to do that. Your, your vocabulary is good enough to get a, a, a 6.5 overall. Um, the main area of weakness when it comes to your speaking, it's not, it's not bad. I can under, um, understand everything you're saying. Um, and if you were making grammatical errors that stopped me understanding what you were saying, you could get a five for grammar, which would bring your whole score down. But you are making lots of little grammatical errors. So prepositions especially articles some verb tenses from time to time um, uh, countable uncountable nouns things that don't stop me understanding anything that you're saying and you're not making them that frequently but they do pop up from time to time especially prepositions um, so that would be my only area of concern but to get a 6.5 i don't think you need to go away and spend six months on a grammar course in order to get that 6.5 writing maybe a little bit different we need to work a little bit more and you make more mistakes when you're writing than you do speaking in terms of grammar but if you really wanted to get to go beyond a band seven let's say in a few years time you want to move to canada or you want to change your career you want to become a doctor and you need a higher score then we would we would maybe uh, really focus on those weak areas of grammar but I don't think we need to do that at the, at the moment. So overall, I would be confident that you would get, you probably would get a seven again. Um, you might get a 6.5 if you got a topic that you were not familiar with and you made, you got nervous and you were making a few more grammatical errors and you were, um, that caused your fluency to drop. But I don't think you would drop below 6.5 um, for the reasons that, that I said. So I think you're pretty safe. Um, and well done. Do you have any questions? Thank you. Uh, that's all thanks. No, I think you should go into the test with a lot of confidence and um, just speak to the examiner in the same way that you spoke to me, like you were talking to a colleague, talking to a friend, and I think you'll be fine.